The Avengers. That's what we call ourselves. Sort of like a team. Earth's mightiest heroes type thing. Avengers, time to work for a living. That's my secret. I'm always angry. I am on the side of life. You get hurt, hurt them back. You get killed, walk it off. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm here to talk to you about the Avengers. Welcome to episode 33 of Some Assembly Required, your weekly adventure into the annals of Earth's mightiest heroes, the Avengers. This week, we're going to be taking a look at Avengers number 31, Never Bug a Giant. Our issue is written by Stan Lee, with pencils by Don Heck, inks by Frank Giacoya, letters by Art Simic, and it comes to us in August of 1966. Okay, so before we get into this issue, I do want to take a moment to talk to you guys about what's going on. So, as I'm sure most of you have realized by now, we have been on a bit of a hiatus for the last five to six weeks. I've lost track, to be honest, a little bit of time. And unfortunately, that was due to my work schedule just not allowing me to have any free time to read, take notes, or record. Thankfully, my work schedule has lightened up to the point where I will be able to get back into recording. However, at this particular moment, at time of recording, my wife and I are in fact expecting baby Groot to show up any day now. With that in mind, I'm recording this episode, as well as several episodes to come here, in order to kind of help cover this time while... We are adapting to becoming new parents and getting ourselves into a bit of a routine with our, let's be honest, significant change in life here. So with that in mind, we are doing all that we can in order to minimize the delays between episodes, but please bear with us while we get our lives squared away a little bit and understand that if there are a couple of weeks where we don't have episodes don't worry there are more coming we are not going away we've got like 500 issues of avengers to cover and i plan on getting through all of this so with that in mind let's get into this week's issue I really enjoy this cover art. It's got a lot of bold colors. It really, really pops, catches the eye. The The tentacle things will come into play here in the story very briefly, so it kind of ties into the story, but I just, I like the look of it. And I realized that while I don't like the heavy use of, of white backgrounds on the covers, I actually do enjoy a heavier use of black backgrounds in the covers, if I had to pick between the two. Obviously, neither of them is particularly ideal, but I think black with all of these really great kind of almost like Technicolor candy color tones on the cover really make it stand out more than the white background would. So our issue picks up where last issue left off, and we have Goliath down in South America. He's trying to find his friend, Dr. Anton, who he thinks can help him stabilize his body enough so that he can return back to normal human size. Because remember, at this point, Giant Man is stuck at 10 feet tall. And if he attempts to shrink himself any lower, it's likely that he will actually die, just straight up. Up until this point, the Avengers don't know where Goliath is. Eventually, they see a news broadcast about something going on in South America, and Wasp recognizes the mode of transportation which Goliath took down to South America, or took in general it, as I said, at the time they didn't know it was South America. Wasp recognizes it from the news report, and the Avengers are now doing what they do best, they are assembling. Uh, also, keep in mind that the Maximovs, so Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, are off in their native land attempting to reboot rejuvenate their powers that they think have begun to diminish and, and they're starting to think that maybe distancing themselves from their homeland has something to do with it so as we pick up this issue wasp and captain america are coming in to get hawkeye and get him involved we start off with Wasp kind of busting hawkeye's chops a little bit in the fact that he is not just flying up and immediately to go and help goliath I think Hawkeye correctly identifies the fact that part of this is because he's starting to rekindle his relationship with Black Widow. Because of that, Wasp doesn't really trust him. Because at this point, Black Widow has just started to overcome the brainwashing of her communist masters. And so they don't have a whole lot of reason to trust her. Hawkeye states the obvious here, but he also acknowledges that this is something he's going to have to deal with, and so he doesn't really take it personally. Now, on the flip side of that, Cap kind of comes back and, and tells Wasp that her comment really is kind of unwarranted, but everyone recognizes that at least in the situation, the comment's understandable. You know, Wasp is has been concerned for Goliath for a little while. Obviously, we know Hank Pym 
has a tendency for manic depressive mood swings, something you know that gets explored a lot more as the series goes on. The fact that he is stuck in the 10 foot tall size really has a negative impact on his mental health and to an extent mental stability. He's been very depressed as his girlfriend, as a woman who loves him, she is very concerned. The fact that she's a little short with characters like Hawkeye is understandable. At the same time, as soon as this is over, Hawkeye and Wasp, you know, have a quick little kind of honest talk about how Hawkeye feels towards Captain America. And the fact that I can't stand the fact that he gives me orders, but I'm still going to do it. You know, this is how the Avengers work kind of deal. The Avengers saddle up and take off in yet another plane. So if you're keeping track, go ahead and take a drink because once again, this is a new one and they head off to South America. While that's happening, we have a quick interlude going back to the Maximovs in their homeland, which at this point is not really specified. So here the art is really good, and at least for these three panels, the content's kind of garbage. There is some really great use of inks and shadows in this entire book, but in these couple panels, really on this page especially. But basically, the Maximovs are talking about how much they love being Avengers and how much they miss it, and that they want their powers to return. Yeah, okay, that's fine, I get it. And then we get a kind of uncomfortable moment for two siblings in the last of the three panels. Uh, I'll leave that moment at that. What really bugs me more about this is the fact that, again, we have the Avengers still split up, and only part of the team is being involved in the story. I mean, really involved. These three panels are just kind of thrown in there to acknowledge that, yes, these characters still exist, and they're still part of the Avengers, but we don't want to deal with them for this story, so we're just taking them out of the equation. That frustrates me a little bit. I'm perfectly happy to have Goliath and Wasp come back to the book, but to then sideline two of the other characters in order to make room for the time being doesn't really sit very well with me. Now, down in South America, we find Goliath... And he is wandering around with Prince Ray, who is the exiled leader of this underground civilization that we will, in a few minutes here, find out is actually descendant from the Incan civilization. Basically, they, they went underground to avoid the Spanish conquistadors, and they were able to develop this amazing civilization. So right now, Goliath and Prince Ray are on the run from the minions of the Keeper of the Flame, who is kind of like the high priest of this organization. And as they are going through these caves, you know, we get to see Goliath fighting off several of these minions. He throws a huge boulder at a rock bridge that kind of looks like the bridge of Khazad-dûm from Fellowship of the Ring, where it's that very narrow rock bridge. So he prevents the minions from coming after him. They lob these explosives at him, which he takes a stalagmite and knocks them back at him like, a, like baseballs and causes a collapse, a cave-in kind of deal. I mean, it's a great fight. I love the physicality of Goliath. You know, when he moves and when he does things in a lot of these scenes, you, you really feel the just the strength and the, the athleticism and the movement behind it. And I really love how that is portrayed. You know, when he's, th he's throwing a boulder, he is swinging a bat. When he swings a bat, the, his proportions look a little weird. But other than that, I love that. The other thing I really love just throughout this issue is the Kirby-esque costumes these characters are wearing but obviously this again this is art by uh don heck whom i still really enjoy and at this time jack kirby really is the marvel house style but in a lot of ways unless kirby's doing it and especially unless kirby's doing something like asgard or like machinery and like fantastic four you don't get the super heavy kirby costume designs and this is just a really nice rendition of that from a different artist so i'm really really pleased with that the one thing that really bugs me here is that if these characters these underground dwelling peoples are supposed to be descendants of the incas who are you know native americans so a, a at least a darker skinned populace you know they're they're portrayed as really white here and i and i kind of get like okay fine if they're generations and generations underground maybe you know they would lose some of their coloring but i mean these guys are are pasty like me after goliath and prince ray get away from those people that are pursuing them prince ray takes him back to a different part of the caves where he and his fellow exiles have been living and we get a real backstory of kind of who these people are and what's going on and probably the biggest thing here is First, it gives us the importance of the Keeper of the Flame. 
I mean, the character really is like a high priest, very much in control, highly respected individual in this culture, but that the current Keeper of the Flame has really overstepped his bounds and wants more and more and more power for himself. He actually is risking, quite honestly, the entire planet for his own gain, because this flame that we're speaking of, in at least in the comics, is powered by cobalt, and that if care is not taken, this cobalt could become this massive, incredible explosion and cause significant damage to the planet. The reality is that cobalt isn't really quite what the comic portrays it as. At one point, Goliath refers to the fact that he had been working on a cobalt bomb, and a cobalt bomb kind of exists. A cobalt bomb would basically be a dirty bomb using radioactive cobalt-60. So it, it doesn't really work the way the issue implies it. Cobalt isn't actually really an explosive in and of itself. The worst that would come from it is basically the spread of radioactivity in the form of cobalt-60. But again, we're in comics, so we'll run with the idea. Getting back to the story, Prince Ray decides that the Keeper of the Flame has become too powerful, and he's got to rally the people against him. So just as he's about to do this, though, the Keeper of the Flame turns against him, and Ray and his followers are forced to flee. Now, as Goliath is listening to this, he comes to the realization that Prince Ray really isn't any better than the Keeper of the Flame. The reality is that Prince Ray doesn't want to remove a crazy person from power. He wants the power for himself, and he is more or less jealous of the power that the Keeper of the Flame has and that his family used to have as, as the royal family. Well, Goliath is having none of this, so he says, screw it, I'm out, I'm not helping you. I'm going to go find my friend, Dr. Anton. You can deal with your own problems. So Goliath flees. Prince Ray sends his men after him. And then we cut back to the Keeper of the Flame telling his minions to go find Goliath. So at this point, everyone is after Goliath. And poor Dr. Anton here is just getting threatened based on the fact that Goliath showed up and wanted to help. And Dr. Anton's like, look, I, I was just here. I found a great power source. I was just like investigating. I'm doing science things. Please don't hurt me. Things are not going well for Dr. Anton. Like, it's, he's having a real bad day here. Now, it's about this time that the rest of the Avengers arrive in South America. When they do, they find where Goliath landed his ship, and they find no trace of him. However, they do run into some local South American police. The police, although this is, I think, a very rosy depiction of South American law enforcement in general, they're not exactly known for their helpfulness and their lack of corruption, but these particular officers are, are very helpful and direct the Avengers off kind of in a general direction. Say, hey, you know, we haven't found them. We're out here looking for Dr. Anton. And since you guys don't know where anyone is, we're, we're going to go and keep looking. So the Avengers take off and find themselves going through this kind of weird cloud cover. When they realize it, it doesn't really seem very natural, they go ahead and, and set themselves down to go investigate further. And it's kind of funny because we see Cap running around with this device in his hand and it's only like the one panel and I want to know what that device is but no, nothing is said about what it is it, it's really not even recognized in the in the panel it appears so I, I, I would love to know what it is though this is a very Goliath centric issue because before cutting back to the Avengers here on just on the last page we went seven pages without seeing any of the other Avengers and we were only on page 10 of the issue like there is a lot of Goliath in this issue which is not necessarily a bad thing I think he's a good character and I think the last couple of issues in the next issue or two focusing on him and him trying to return to his normal size I think is fine obviously you know if the book were to sit and focus on him for 30 issues that might be problematic but I don't think we're going to get that so I'm not particularly concerned but it is interesting to note now, unfortunately, in this part of the story, the art is still really strong, but the story in and of itself kind of falls off. Goliath is running around. He's trying to find Dr. Anton. He's periodically encountering minions. He's smashing equipment. He finally runs into the Keeper of the Flame, who saps away his strength, and kind of out of nowhere, his fellow Avengers show up. I really want to know how the Avengers, like, found Goliath, found the caves. Because last time we left them, they were just kind of on a mountain top so i don't it doesn't really connect very well how they got from point a to point b i mean like i said for about three to four pages here the story kind of peters off and it's just pushing forward towards a conclusion gives you a lot of action a lot of really good art very 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 heavy kirby influence but i would have appreciated it if 
we had a little bit more of a cohesive narrative going on. Actually, I, I misspoke a moment ago. The Avengers actually don't encounter Goliath for a while yet. They do, however, find their way into the tunnel system. Uh, they fight some of the Keeper of the Flames minions, and then they are captured by a steel-cabled net, which I love because it's so classic, right? Capturing the good guys in a net that they can't escape from like that. Oh, it's just, it just oozes comic book and Saturday morning cartoon. And I love it. It's so much fun. Now, of course, Wasp being Wasp size is not trapped in this net. So Wasp remains free and Captain America and a Hawkeye are taken before the Keeper of the Flame. You know, basically, Keeper of the Flame says, well, I'm going to sacrifice you guys as punishment because, well, that's kind of what we do. And he extends these metal tentacle kind of arms, like flexible arms. They're kind of like Doc Ock's arms, actually, is what they look like a little bit to me. They reach out and they grab the Avengers and they grab Goliath, who just happens to be there. Again, it's a little weird. Like I said, we're, we seem to be jumping around a bit and it feels like, I don't think there are missing panels, but it feels like we're missing little chunks of the story that connect the scenes that we're seeing. You know, it, it makes enough sense that it's not a problem, but that the narrative cohesion is choppy at best uh, in the end of this book, which is unfortunate. Right as the Avengers are taken hold of by these tentacle arm things, it was like Prince Ray and his men attack the Keeper of the Flame, and we get this huge, really cool, and we get, well, actually, we actually get a couple of them, sound effects that are across the panel and really give you a great sense of... I mean, the sound, right? That's the purpose of the, the written sound effect. But especially when you get something like, it says, Baba Room, and you can just kind of feel the shaking and, and the, the effect. It's, it's not just a sound that you hear. It is a sound that you feel that hits you in the chest. You know, your whole body just reacts to it. I love that kind of effect because it, it really makes you understand what's going on. It's it's far more immersive in the story. So now we've got kind of a this, this weird three for all going where you've got the Keeper of the Flame and his people. You've got Prince Ray and his people and then you've got the Avengers. Uh, while this is going on, Wasp manages to fly in and hit the controls to free the Avengers. So now they have much more of a fighting chance. There's some great action sequences going on as different groups are kind of counteracting one another and and fighting off each other and finally we get to a point where hawkeye cap and goliath have kind of worked themselves really kind of into a corner cap tells hawkeye of this target that wasp has found that should be able to take out the flame right because really that that's that's kind of the central issue here is that everyone is after the flame or at least prince ray and the keeper of the flame that's that's the power they want so Cap thinks by removing it, by removing the prize, maybe the two sides won't necessarily just come to a standstill, but it will certainly hopefully de-escalate the situation. It will certainly change the, the situation entirely and possibly remove the reason they're fighting. So Hawkeye launches a blast arrow on top of this idol that is apparently filled with explosives and uses that explosion to take out the flame. What this really reminds me of, and... I betray my age a little bit here because I was a, I was a kid when this was going on is during the first Gulf War or shortly after uh, Saddam Hussein had in his retreat from Kuwait had basically set oil fires to most of the Kuwaiti uh, oil oil rigs and they had to use explosives to put out a lot of these fires. This really kind of reminds me of that. Yeah, obviously, you know, the, these are separated by 30 years. However, that is certainly a legitimate way of putting out certain types of fires. So using a blast like that really just, to me, makes a lot of sense and, and correlates with something that I have a memory of from my childhood of, of seeing films and, and whatnot of different groups. I think Army Corps of Engineers is involved in whatnot using blasting methods to put out these fires. From a storytelling perspective, it's a little deus ex machina, but the Avengers kind of worked themselves into a bit of a corner and the story gets resolved by the fact that Wasp finds this ideal target for them to attack that we've never seen before and we have no other context for. You know, Hawkeye takes the shot and boom, the issue's done. I mean, really, like, it's a beautiful explosion panel. But really, that explosion panel, that's on the last page. That After, after that, it's really just a couple of panels of, of mopping up and that's it. But with the story being so choppy, I would have liked to have seen this connect in a little bit tighter. Maybe a conversation or a thought bubble from the Keeper of the Flame. I don't even remember seeing the idol anywhere else in 
the issue. So, I mean, maybe just the idol being there more. A little bit more internal continuity, internal consistency would have been nice. After the, the large explosion, which again is such a beautiful panel, it's a little filled with word balloons and I really wish it weren't, but I still really enjoy the explosion panel. The issue really just kind of wraps up and again, the sides stop fighting. They, they just let the Avengers leave. The issue closes out with Goliath in, in costume talking to Dr. Anton and Dr. Anton says, I don't think I can help you, but... The person who I think can help you, this is the most brilliant biochemist in the field, a man named Henry Pym. And what that's really getting at is the idea that if anyone is going to solve this problem, it is going to be Hank Pym. He is going to solve his own problem here. And that realizing he is the best man in his field of study. So yeah, things may not have worked out exactly the way he thought they were going to, but he needs to not give up faith in himself. I think that's always a good lesson. Overall, this story is far more visually interesting than it is narratively. Yes, there are aspects of the story that I I really enjoyed, but at the same time, it doesn't really progress for several pages. It jumps kind of over parts that would otherwise connect the story. I enjoy the fact that there's a little twist in here and that really neither side is worth supporting, neither Prince Ray nor the Keeper of the Flame. But beyond that, I don't really care about the conflict. I don't have a whole lot of of reason to. Neither the Keeper of the Flame nor Prince Ray are particularly sympathetic characters. The other issue here, and, and I mentioned this before, is is really is the whitewashing of the Incan descendants and the relationship that the heroes have with them. I think unfortunate is the, the best way to describe it. I certainly don't think this was an intentional decision, but at best it comes across as insensitive. Like, I, I really just, I have a hard time seeing Stanley, Jack Kirby, Don Hay, like that whole group of people. I have a hard time seeing them making intentionally decisions to make native characters white. Again, it's the 1960s, so... That kind of thing was certainly more socially acceptable, if not entirely socially acceptable. But, yes, historical context matters, but only to a certain extent. And the whitewashing of those characters, it really just isn't an acceptable practice. Remember, you can find us at AvengersAssembly.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can find this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation, send your questions and comments to Andrew at AvengersAssembly.com. Next week, we're going to be taking a look at Avengers number 32, The Sign of the Serpent. All right, hey. All right, good job, guys. Uh, Let's just not come in tomorrow. Let's just take a day. Have you ever tried shawarma? There's a shawarma joint about two blocks from here. I don't know what it is, but I want to try it.